Hello, good morning to all the attendees to this uh, new chapter of the EICF webinar series. Thank you very much for connecting uh, and attending the webinar. As we always do, we have a reminder for the people who is going through these difficulties caused by the pandemic. The figures of yesterday give us an overall value of 53 million people in Europe and cases and 964,000 people there. As we always indicate our solidarity with the community, with the, with the families, and in particular also with the companies that have to navigate with the, this crisis. It seems that Europe is facing now what they call a sixth wave. Hopefully, the effect of vaccination, the effect of the implementation of the health and safety measures will allow us to avoid lockdowns and to continue the economical activity, which is so relevant for our society. As uh, you are well acquainted, we started this series of webinars in a situation of answers of a, a true technical conference, physical. Uh, today, we are having the last webinar from the block of November. Uh, we shall be starting on the 1st of December with the last four webinars of the year. And it's interesting to see that the last four webinars of the year that will be uh, uh, given in, in December, they do all have uh, a different but common approach to the to the cell making no? from different points of view. But it's going to be like an intensive uh, uh, through about this uh, technology. For those of you that are familiar. Uh, Please, uh, I remind you that you need to use the chatbot, which is on the right side of the screen. And it is very important, in particular, when you want to raise your questions or to type your questions, do not forget, please, to click the question mark, as it's indicated here by the arrow, before you hit enter. Uh, by doing that, we shall be able to share the question with the, with the rest of the attendees in a written form. Also, it is important to remind that the presentation of today, you have a handout to download. In order to do that, you have to go to the share files tab. And in that tab, you will be find a document that you could uh, download. <coughs> For those who have missed the EICF webinar series of this year, uh, let's remind that there is a website uh, in which you could access. And all those webinars are available on demand. Uh, the only uh, exclusive element of this is this only a service for EICF members. Also important to highlight that uh, everything is ready for our conference next year in the springtime in the beautiful city in the north of Spain of Santander. The dates are from the 15th of, November, of May to the 18th of May 2022. And uh, soon we shall be starting the registrations and all information about the program. But in the meantime, if you can have some information about this or just thinking in joining the EICF, please check it out at the EICF.org. Today, we have a presentation that uh, is, is uh, highlighting one of the, I think, important aspects of the relationship between the suppliers to the industry and the foundry, uh, which is the fact that we can get technological support, the founders can get technological support from the suppliers in providing technical solutions, which some of those are very specific and very high demand. In this case, what we are going to see is how it can be formulated a special type of binder or a special type of application, in this case, with high temperature application for ES and senior crystals. And in order to do that, we have the collaboration of Branson and Randolph today with uh, Mr. Kyle Wellman, which is also well known by the audience, which will, will lead us about all this uh, interesting approach of how to accomplish with this solution. Okay, Carlos. So, Karel, the floor is yours. Thank you okay, for that. Carlos, thank you very much for the introduction. And good morning to everybody. Thank you for attending this presentation. Um, so my name is Karel Wegman. I work as an application engineer for Ransom and Randolph. I give technical support to all of our customers in the UK, the Benelux, Scandinavia, and Israel. 
I'm uh, now over 20 years active in the investment casting industry, where from the last 10 years at R&R. &R. Um, today, I want to tell you something about the development and the technical background of binders used for high temperature applications. Although the original paper is already quite a few years old, I believe it's still a very act actual topic and could be very helpful for any foundry who is interested in, in casting blades or veins for IGT or aerospace industry. So through this presentation, I hope to learn you something about the physical conditions of a shell and how the binder is of influence when it's subjected to certain high temperatures during the cast process. So the agenda for today is as follow. After an introduction and the background information, I will explain something about the different phases of the evaluation that we went through. In the end, I will tell you something about latest developments and we will summarize it through a conclusion. So how did this all start? Well, techno technological capabilities and requirements of the investment casting process continue to evolve. Requirements on the ceramic shell are getting more and more demanding, especially the aerospace industry with its blade and vein segments put great demands on the shell system. Both directional solidification and single crystal casting processes um, expose the shell to high temperatures. Shells are put in conditions of 1500 degrees C for sometimes longer as two hours while under load of the molten metal. This requires the shell to possess adequate high temperature strength and creep resistance at levels that are much more demanding than those normally required in commercial foundries. r, &R developed a colloidal silica binder in conjunction with Rolls-Royce to meet these high temperature demands of their process, as well as to successfully create shells for their specific geometric complexity of the blade trailing edge. This presentation will compare the specialty colloidal silica binder to a traditional colloidal silica sole, and laboratory test data will be presented to highlight its properties. All details can be found um, in the by Rolls Royce co authorized paper the development and application of a specialty colloidal silica for high temperature applications. This is available through r, &R but I think it can also be handed out um, by cars. So how does this happen? So while the original binder was being phased out and would no longer be available, Rolls-Royce was looking for a replacement binder being capable to produce single crystal castings. The requirements were stated as follows. It had to be compatible with current flower and stucco materials, preventing dimensional changes. It had to have equal or better green and fire strength to improve DOX performance, equal or better strength at cast temperature, equal or lower strength post-cast to avoid hot or cold tearing and recrystallization and a minimum six months slurry life, but preferably up to one year. We deem that the hot properties as being the most critical from a development and application standpoint. The binder developed was given the experimental code um, of EHT binder, which stands for extra high temperature. It is a water-based polymer-free colloidal silica. One of its primary features is a special controlled particle size, particle distribution, and an elevated, elevated SiO2 level. We went through three different trial stages. The first evaluation was done in-house at the r, &R lab in Maumee, USA. Based on the Rolls-Royce criteria, the main parameter measured was MOR strength. For the internal trial, the material was compared to a conventional small particle colloidal silica, which we will call CCS through this presentation. 
At a later stage, the project proceeded further with testing at an independent laboratory and a foundry trial at a Rolls-Royce plant in Derby, the UK. The properties of the binders we used to build the backup slurry were as follows. The CCS binder has a typical particle size of 10 nanometer and a silica content of 31 and percent. But in this comparison, it was diluted with water back to 26 and percent, a level that is more commonly used in commercial foundries. EHT has compared to the CCS binder, a higher specific gravity and binder solids percentage and also less surface area. Both um, binders we used to make backup slurries, each with a 200 mesh zircon flower at 75% refractory loading level. The viscosities of the backup slurries were quite different. It was 13 seconds on a ZAN4 for the EHT slurry and 11 seconds on a ZAN4 for the CCS slurry. For the primary coating uh, of test samples, both shared the same prime slurry based on the RNR specialty binder and a 200 mesh zircon at 80% refractory loading. The shelling sequence was the same for both with zircon and with tablet alumina stucco. Intercoat dry time was kept at two and a half hours under a moderate airflow and ambient temperature of about 24 degrees C. All stucco application was done by rainfall sanding. Firing or pre-firing is obviously a very important process that uh, promotes the consolidation of the shell structure. It develops the shell strength to sustain the stress exerted by metal during pouring. We chose four firing temperatures to look at the impact on strength for the two binders. We believe that the range of uh, between 900 and 1350 degrees C is wide enough to cover, to cover typical shell temperatures for both commercial and aerospace applications. Test bars were fired at these temperatures for one hour and cooled prior to further testing. Both the EHT and CC, CCS binder test bars were tested using the RNR three point bending test equipment. Our unique piece of equipment is capable to measure MOR bars at ambient test temperature up to an environment of 1600 degrees C. It is also capable to record real time load versus deflection during the test. All bars were tested in the following conditions. Were green, which is unfired and uh, prior to de-waxing, of course. Post-fired, which is fired to one of the four temperatures, cooled and then tested. And hot, which is also fired, then cooled, re-fired to the test temperature and tested. For each hot strength test, the cold post-fired bar was loaded into the test unit and soaked at the intended temperature for three minutes before a load was applied. Tests were carried out at two temperatures, at 1200 degrees C, which represents the average shell temperature after casting steel in a typical commercial foundry, and at 1450 degrees C, which represents the typical temperature in an aerospace foundry. The creep of the shell was considered important for high temperature applications like directional solidification and single crystal, since the alloy remains molten for a long period of time and exhibits a force on the shell. And samples were tested to monitor how this deflection was progressing as a function of time under a constant weight and a constant temperature. Two weights were chosen. 400 grams for the EHT sample and 300 grams for the CCS sample. Because the EHT sample was generally thicker as the CCS sample, different weights were chosen so that they translate in about the same level of stress on the sample. 
Just like the MOR test, the creep test was also carried out at the two temperatures of 1200 degrees C and 1400 degrees C. The other two tests that we performed were plate weight and the edge thickness. The plate weight measures, um, measurement evaluates the slurry pickup uh, ability. Ideally, the more the slurry gets picked up for each dip, the thicker the shell becomes. A square plate of polished brass was used for this test. The edge thickness test uh, is intended to show how the shell is building up around a very thin edge. Thin wax plates were used for this purpose. The thickness is representative of the thickness at the trailing edge of a gas turbine blade. The strips were shelled according to the general shell sequence. And after the samples were cut, fired to burn off the wax and visually examined to reveal the thickness variations of the flat side and around the edge. So to this point, we have covered the background, the basics of the binder, and we have outlined the, the testing procedures for the in-house evaluations. And um, before I will present the results, I want to explain some of the terminology used. I mean, the two most common measurements of the shell strength are modulus of rupture, MOR, and adjusted fracture load. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it, but I would like to quickly explain again. MOR is an intrinsic material property of shell strength. It's measured through a three-point bending test, and it measures the maximum stress a sample can handle. AFL is performed by the same test, but it takes the sample thickness into account and is therefore a measure of the load-bearing capacity. Thus, a shell material with a low OR can achieve the same degree of crack resistance when it has more shell thickness. Now, shell thickness is normally increased in two ways, by using more total coats or by applying thicker individual coats. A shell material with a high MOR would allow foundries to cut coats and still maintain an adequate load bearing. Therefore, increasing MOR or AFL is a generally accepted way to improve the resistance to cracking and fracture. That being said, internal RNR research has proven that the shell permeability has also a big effect on its capability to resist wax expansion forces. But maybe this is something that, that we have to explain in detail during another presentation. So now we're going to look to the data that we have generated. And this is the data for the green strength and sample thickness. And note that next to the value for each parameter, there is a number in brackets. This is the normalization of the data to the CCS value. So for example, the thickness of the CCS was four and a half millimeters. That of the EHT is 5.1. So normalized, the CCS is one and the EHT is 1.13. And therefore we can conclude that the EHT sample was 30% thicker. The EHT samples were significantly thicker while they were shelled with the same number of cuts. And the viscosity was at the same refractory loading, lower as the CCS, was 11 seconds on the ZAR4 instead of the 30 seconds for the CCS on the same cut. The MOR is also 30% higher for the EHT, which could correlate to less chance of cracking shells. Because of the combined greater thickness and MOR, AFL is 49% higher of the EHT samples as compared to the CCS slurry. Now, we will take a look at the hot properties of both systems. 
And as explained, it was interesting to look at two test temperatures, 1200 degrees C, which represents commercial foundries, and the 1450 for the high temperature used in aerospace foundries. The test results at 1200 degrees C need some further explanation. We expected CDMOR to increase as the initial firing temperature increases. But at the test temperature of 1200 degrees C, the test bars that were fired at the lower temperature of 900 and 1050 degrees C were too ductile to be broken. The samples bent to a point exceeding the allowance displacement of our testing units. These bars were eventually successfully tested at 1000 and 1100 degrees C, but we decided to leave this data out of the presentation because it was not in line with the objective and it could not be compared to the other data. And now you actually, you might wonder what is, what is happening here at this low temperature. Um, when a firing temperature increases, the hot deformation of the shell decreases. It becomes stiffer. And it indicates a change of the ceramic structure during this sintering process. At a lower firing temperature, the strengthening takes place mainly through a rearrangement of the silica particles in the binder. At a higher firing temperature, a glass phase sintering mechanism begins and further strengthens the structure of the entire ceramic sample. So therefore, when fired to higher temperatures, the, the glass or, or liquid phase will eventually form a more profound network that holds the refractory grains and provides therefore further strength. Now, this graph provides the same hot MOR data as the previous one, but for the test temperature at 1450 degrees C. And now we actually see the opposite trend as was seen at the test temperature of 1200 degrees C. The hot MOR for both the EHT and CCS binder decreased while we increase the firing temperature. 1450 degrees C is of course well above the transition temperature of the glass phase. And the reduction in the shell at this higher firing temperature is because the presence of this liquid glass phase allows the refractory grains to slide over each other and it's weakening the shell when it's subjected to a load. So a higher firing temperature promotes a more complete glass phase network and therefore an easier grain sliding. So let's take a look at the raw data. This is the hot MOR data from all four different firing temperatures, but tested at the higher temperature of 1450 degrees C. Also here we normalize the data in brackets against the CCS value. And the trend that we, that's shown here is that the EHT binder has higher hot strength value at every test temperature compared to the CCS binder. Actually at the test temperature of 1200 degrees C, it's even double compared to the CCS binder. So we believe that this increased strength of the EHT of the EHT binder is uh, due to its unique SiO2 level and particle size distribution. So now we will take a look at the creep curves of the test bars. Creep is a behavior where the shell undergoes deformation when it is subjected to a constant load and usually performed at an elevated temperature. And a complete and typical creep curve shows the strain or the deformation on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And a creep test normally 
comprises three stages of deformation. And they're defined as follow. You've got the first initial stage um, where you see a rapid deformation. And this normally stops in a short period of time. And then in the second phase, you see a continued slow deformation. And uh, it's typically with a, 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 a very constant deformation rate. The third and the final rapid deformation is immediately followed up by a catastrophic failure of the sample. Depending on the applied load, the test temperature and material properties, creep deformation might take place slowly and exhibits only the first two phases. Or deformation can take place very rapidly and it leads to an almost immediate catastrophic failure uh, as we see in the phase three only. If creep deformation is unavoidable, it is more desirable to control the deformation within this second phase, where there is a slow and steady deformation rate before the metal solidification is completed. Creep resistance of a shell is important, not only to avoid delayed leakers, but also to assure the casting its dimensional accuracy. Creep resistance is even more critical for direct solidification or single crystal casting foundries because during the extended solidification process, the shell is subject to the molten metal pressure at elevated temperatures. The creep data that we generated during our research is excessive and complex. So instead of showing you everything, I would like to present some limited data, but it does represent the differences between the two binders. This graph here shows the creep analysis done at a test temperature of 1200 degrees C, but the samples were fired at 1050 degrees C. The data shows that the two binders behave completely equal. Both the curves exhibit only the first and the second stage of the deformation during the 60 minutes of the test. So we can conclude that the creep difference between EHT and CCS is insignificant when the firing temperature is 1050 or lower. Given the fact that the typical firing temperature for both for, for commercial foundries is around 1000 degrees C, we believe that they will not probably find EHC binder as a useful um, solution in resolving creep related issues such as delayed leakers or hot deformation. But since this is R&D, we want to see where we would start seeing creep-related benefits of EHT binder. So by raising the initial firing temperature to 1350 degrees C and test the creep properties at 1200 degrees C, we start to begin to see differences. The CCS, um, which is here represented in green, shows more deflection while the EHT is more rigid, which is the brown line. So this indicates that as the firing temperature increases, the binder begins to perform different from a creep standpoint. And this trend is in agreement with the conventional knowledge that firing the shells to a higher temperature can be a solution to resolve bulging issues. And as discussed previously, Shells fired at a higher temperature develop a more cohesive structure through the formation of the glass phase network. So consequently, they are more creep resistant if tested at a lower or equal temperature. So this portion of the creep data was obtained at the 
high test temperature of 1450 degrees C. In this graph, I only show the data for the samples fired at 1050 degrees C, but it represents the data in general. Both binders show a catastrophic failure. So that being said, the EHT sample failed 50 minutes later as the CCS binder, indicating it has better creep properties. It must be noted that the stress level applied was 120 PSI. This is considered very high. We chose this high stress to see clearly the differences between the binders. For any test temperature that we uh, performed, it took the EHT sample longer to give a, a, a given strain or deformation than the CCS sample. So shell build. For casting gas turbine blades and vanes, the shell thickness is of course very important, not only on flat surfaces, but more critically around the thin and sharp trailing edge. Obviously it's harder to retain slurry and stucco on a sharp edge as on a surface. And as a result, the trailing edge of a vein becomes the weakest point and it's most likely to crack at D-Rex. Foundries often build shells with extra coats to just to build up sufficient thickness around the sharp corner, but the extra coats typically provide a little benefit to the rest of the shell. The picture here shows the differences seen of the shell built at the edge thickness. And you can clearly see the difference. Compared to the CCS sample, a 13% improvement in overall shell thickness was measured with EHT. Around the edge, a 25 up to 50% improvement was measured. The plate weight confirmed a 17% greater pickup of slurry with EHT as compared with the CCS binder, while the viscosity is lower. So obviously, this was considered beneficial for as a thicker shell will increase the load bearing capacity of the shell. So at this stage, we finalized all our in-house testing and we were comfortable that EHT would make a viable candidate for Rolls-Royce new binder and we submitted it. The next phase was driven by Rolls-Royce. They contracted the University of Birmingham to do an independent evaluation on EHT, but also on other binders that were submitted. In the end, a total of 16 binder candidates, including the legacy binder, were evaluated on different properties. We cannot share specific details of all the procedures nor the test results, but the test mainly concerned a three point fracture test and edge strength. Edge strength is, of course, very critical for blade and vein castings due to its geometry. This test was historically developed by RNR and the University of Birmingham. Uh, perhaps this is something to present in detail during another seminar. Um, samples were in the attested green and dry, green and wet, which represents the strength in the autoclave, pre-fired, burned out, and cooled, which represents um, the handling strength after the first firing stage, post-fired, which tells something about you know, the easiness of removal um, of the shell after casting, and finally, of course, the hot strength at 1475 degrees C. This table shows the ranked results of the 16 systems that were tested at the university. And as explained, I don't have specific results, but based on this table, EHT jumped out in, in being the second best at dry green strength, best in wet and green and pre-fired strength, best in high temperature for hot strength. It was low on post-fired strength, 
but that's actually good for show removal, so seen as a benefit. So even, you know, we were officially really focused on the hot property improvements. We were very pleased that, you know, the green performance was doing very good versus the other 15 candidates. As last evaluation, Rolls-Royce um, conducted trials with EHT in their Derby production plant. The first trials were conducted on five designs that represent the uh, various family of castings at Rolls-Royce. The initial results showed that EHT was causing a slight dimensional change. But thanks to its improved shell build and strength, a reduction in coats was possible, and this put the dimensions back into acceptable tolerances. Trials were followed up by a rollout of the binder across the complete product portfolio um, in this plant. But during this scaled up trial, further issues were raised with an interaction between the shell and the cast aerofoil. On the longer blades, recrystallization was seen in the aerofoil due to stretching of the blade um, on cooldown. So while the dimensional issues were resolved, another major issue had to be addressed. So r, &R went back to the lab and we continued uh, investigating what would be the effect of further shell code reductions. And luckily, the, pro the problem was in the end resolved um, by further altering the number of the coats on the mold, as well as a change of the robot draining programs. And the issues had to be resolved on a part by part basis. But I think you know this is inherent to the development of any new slurry or shell system in a foundry. Um, so it was considered normal and successful in the end. Finally, you know, the feedback from Rolls-Royce was very positive when EHT was introduced and it was adopted for continuous production of, for them, very important castings. Overall, the, the further introduction went very well with the majority of the parts being manufactured to the same process with the same pr program, only difference that the number of codes required to achieve the same strength was reduced for the most parts. So in the end, a technical paper was co-authorized by Rolls-Royce, written by r, r which is available through uh, the EICF and by r, r directly. So the overall conclusion, EHT binder built shelves that are stronger than the CCS, uh, the, 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 the uh, commercial colloidal counterparts in green as well as post-fired. General speaking, increasing the firing temperature from 900 to a 1350 degrees C increases the hot strength when tested at 1200 degrees C, but it decreases when tested at 1450 degrees C. Nevertheless, EHT binder outperforms the CCS binder regardless of the firing temperature and testing temperature. Under the same level of stress, EHT binder shells exhibit a stronger creep resistance at both 1200 and 1450 degrees C. EHT slurry builds thicker shell with the same number of coats. Uh, not just on you know, flat surfaces, but also on the thin edge. An independent study test confirms that you know, the time at EHT binder you know, performs best among 15 other binder systems around the time. EHT has been, in the end, officially adopted as the backup slurry binder for directional solidification and single crystal castings at Rolls-Royce. Although the focus of EHT will always be 
on hot strength performance. It is what it is designed for. We wondered at r, &R how its performance would be influenced when it is combined with a modern binder concentrate, whereas EHT itself holds no polymer. The concentrates in our, what we call matrix code family of products, contain polymers, surfactants like antifoam, wetting agents, bactericides, and in some cases, even fibers. We combined EHT with our MXC XL concentrate with the main objective to improve the green strength. From the normalized data, you can clearly see that the additional polymer makes a significant improvement to the green strength. It did, however, reduce the hot MOR, but it's not considered an issue, for as the additional shell build equalizes the AFL figures. So nevertheless, what we can conclude from this research is that EHT is capable to fit within r, &R comprehensive solutions program. Its performance can be adjusted to resolve specific issues in any foundry. My colleague Bastian Schulze will um, tell you more about our benchmarking and comprehensive solutions program uh, beginning of next month during his presentation for the uh, webinar series. And this finalizes my presentation. Um, if there are any questions, then that will be guided by uh, Carlos. Thank you very much, Karel. Very comprehensive uh, paper. Thank you. Very, very well conducted in order to, to follow all the different aspects. Uh, as always, indicate to the audience that if they want to put forward any questions, please type your questions, click the question mark, and then hit end. While the audience is uh, addressing uh, any of those questions, there is a couple of elements uh, I would like to, to highlight with you. Mm -hmm. When you, when you mention the tests uh, performed at the uh, uh, University of Birmingham, uh, it was first mentioned the, the permeability test and analysis. However, in your presentation, we, you did not uh, put forward any data about it. What, what is the reason for? Well, permeability was not identified as a, a critical objective. For us, it concerns single crystal and directional solidification casting um, under the vacuum. Permeability was of less interest in this case. Um, this will most likely be the case of any other situation where EHT is applied. However, we do expect that the permeability will be influenced in a negative way, if you can say negative, because EHT is a much higher density binder as any other. Um, but as I said, current research has shown that EHT is compatible with a fiber enhanced concentrate. Um, so if needed, the permeability can be improved by another polymer fiber concentrate or, you know, of course, a coarser particle size um, refractory. Um, that I want to say, you know, of course, the, the, the shell conditions, if you decide to make this change, have to be monitored very carefully for as this could jeopardize the, um, the hot strength performance. So, you know, again, this is a very good reason to follow our benchmarking process and comprehensive solutions. Okay. The, and, and again, I think this is um, relevant to this uh, concept of this idea that um, uh, from an overall system assessment, cell system assessment, at the end, the adjustment has to be made on a part-by-part -part basis. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay. Well, one of the aspects also that is inherent to this uh, presentation is um, the concept of uh, uh, a supplier to the industry providing technical solutions. Uh, what is the approach of Ransom and Randolph into that? 
Well, I think I think this is this is very important to us. Um, it's, it's really also something that that I that I personally stand for. We we don't want to sell just a a product. We want to sell a solution to a foundry which is unique for the foundry's um, 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 requirements. And um, this is how how we currently work with our um, product range. Um, it is it is it, it can be modified to unique objectives and requirements for a foundry. So not just a product, but a solution. And this comes with just like we did here um, with a tremendous amount of time to develop this for a foundry. But it needs to bring that extra bit. Okay, and the discussion on the paper was uh, logically it was centered on the on on the binder. Is there anything to comment on the Stuco applied? The Stuco applied. Um, there was, I mean, I mean, uh, there was indeed the sheet um, where I um, mentioned. Yeah, you, you indicated that, yeah. But but the question is, if there are any efforts by also including in the design of the experiments different stucos or no so for this test we have used um, um terra elemina stuco on the backup codes um there has been recently some other tests with other stuco but i can't recall what it exactly is but there's definitely anything possible okay uh... We connected with this idea of solutions that you just mentioned. And one of the elements that we have now on the table is the 3D printing. And investment casting has been very close to 3D printing since the early days, especially in um, uh, models of patterns, stereography, uh, mm -hmm. SLA, SLS, well, different solutions. Mm -hmm. And now a new, a new guy comes to town, as the Americans used to say, no? they, they are starting to speak about uh, 3D printed molds. What mm -hmm. is the position of Ransom and Randolph in, into this? Are you pursuing this as a, an RD line or what, what is the status of that? Well, I can confirm this is a recurring topic during our R&D meetings. Um, we are currently not active developing materials specialized for 3d printing ceramic molds that being said we have we have indeed contacts who are working on this and we try to help them with our existing materials um developing this so yes who knows what the future will bring but it's definitely an active topic Okay, so we have one question here. I think it's a question that uh, somehow we, we have uh, commented, but anyhow, it's from Juan Antonio Paul. Are there any studies with EHT, EHT binder and alumina backup codes? Um, yeah, so, so as confirmed and um, in the presentation, we were using tabular alumina uh, stucco materials, um, but not with the Alumina um, refractory in the slurry, but if this is of course of interest, then we can we can perform this at our lab. Okay, another question from uh, Oxen Kosen from uh, Ahen. How many samples were tested to get each, to get each datum of the mechanical test results you just presented? Do you have the standard deviation values of them? Um, I don't have that here right in front of me. Um, but that's definitely something that I can um, um, I can discuss and share with uh, Mr. Cohen. Okay, thank you for that. A question for Dr. Constantin Jan. Maybe I missed, but that. But did you form solid specimen from the slurry, or was there a was substrate? Did you observe any volume effects with investigations due to a small particle size in contrast to the usual sample sizes? Small particle size compared to the usual sample size. I'm I'm not sure if I completely understand this question. Does this does this concern the build of the MOR bars? And um, the the uniform cell specimen. I mean, of course, we build MOR bars using a a a wax uh, a wax bar which was dipped in the slurry. I'm not sure if that answers the question. 
Well, that's just the typical way to do this. this yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. In, in relation with this, uh, one of the things when I, when you discuss about the trading edge, uh, and you have some uh, some test bars trying to be representative of the correct correct of the thickness of the trading edge. Yeah. However, however, uh, from my experience, uh, there are much more aggressive trading ends below the figure of 1.2 millimeters. Oh, and sure. I, I guess that um, that was addressed in the real tests that were made by by Rolls Royce. No, mm -hmm. but uh, is there anything to comment on the on the on these trading edge uh, uh, elements with the real tests? Any any feedback that you received from the real tests? um no well in case a case of of rolls royce that didn't cause any problems and um i agree i mean i mean the wax plates that we used at our lab i mean they were very thin but it doesn't necessarily you know completely translate in what you see in production um but, you know it was a good a good a good indication to start off um and obviously to come back on on, on the original question i mean um we don't see differences, of course, in the sample size because all our samples are cut to specific dimensions. Okay, so I don't see any more uh, questions from the, from the audience. There's a final check. And I just want to thank you again, Karel, for this excellent uh, presentation and uh, going through these uh, different questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, also thank you to Ransom and Randolph for for the courtesy of this webinar and the floor is yours to say farewell to the audience yeah well of course i want to thank everybody who um was present and i want to thank you carlos for setting this up again and um obviously I'm, I'm really looking forward to next year and um i hope to see you all in real life in santander um and uh, i hope to give a presentation to them and um, yeah, thank you very much. And if there are any further questions, uh, I can be contacted directly. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.